Because he died, the curtain that lied between God and man was torn. Because he died, God's plan was realized. Tetelestai. Because he died, eternity altered. Mercy was won at the altar. Because he died, deaths outbid. Because he died, I live. Surely he took up our pain. He bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. These words were inspired by the Holy Spirit of God and given through the prophet Isaiah about seven centuries before Jesus walked on this earth. <clears throat> Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And we gather today, this Good Friday, one of the most sacred days in the whole year for followers of Jesus, to remember that his body was broken, that his blood was shed. I want to encourage you to make sure you're ready for communion. Not just in your heart, but you have the elements ready because when we come to the table today, we celebrate Jesus and what he has done for us. We're in this series called Because. And today we're thinking about the, the reality that because he died, because Jesus died on the cross, his body was broken, his blood was shed, everything changes. And I want to invite you just to open your heart to hear the difference that's been made through Jesus Christ, through his willing sacrifice on the cross. Because he died, here's the first thing. On the cross, he took my sin. I live as one utterly cleansed. Because Jesus died, my sin is gone. It is washed away. The God of the universe, who is holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty, looks at me and looks at you if you've come to the cross and received Jesus. He looks at us and he says, what sin? I see no sin in you. Because Jesus died. Listen to these words from Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 to 14. If you have your Bible or your Bible app, open to Colossians and let these words speak to your heart and let them fill your mind. Understand what God is saying. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. All our sins. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Because he died, because Jesus hung on the cross, our sins are washed away. We live a life utterly cleansed. I want you to imagine that about three years ago, my mortgage company called me and they said, Kevin, you've got many years to still pay on your house, but, but good news, we're going to pay it off. It's down to a zero. No more payments. We'll send you the paperwork. The house is yours. Wouldn't that be amazing? It didn't happen. <laughs> I don't know if any mortgage company has called and said it's paid off when it isn't paid off, when you didn't do it. But Jesus comes and says, because I died on the cross, your sin is gone. It is paid for. That's amazing. Because he died, everything changes. The perfect God of heaven has taken your sin and my sin and buried it in the deepest sea through the work of Jesus Christ. And so this Good Friday, I want you to think about this reality that because he died, my sins are washed away. And I want to ask you to pray with me. 
maybe in a way you've never quite prayed before. I want to ask you to not just listen to me pray, but to pray from your heart, oh God Almighty, you sent Jesus Christ. He died on the cross. His body was broken. His blood was shed. Oh Jesus, you gave your life for me. And you washed away my sins. I am cleansed. I am washed clean. My sins are as far as the east is from the west. I give you praise, Lord Jesus, for paying the price, for taking my sins, for washing me clean. May you receive the praise and may I understand this truth in a deeper way than I ever have before, that I am cleansed. I pray this in your name, Jesus, and for your glory. Amen. Let me ask you a question. Can you believe and declare these words? I have been washed clean. Can you believe it in your mind? Can you say it with your lips? I have been washed clean. Wherever you are, whether you're alone or with a group of people, will you say these words with me? I have been washed clean. Let's say it again. I have been washed clean. Now, like you mean it from the depth of your soul. I have been washed clean. It's true through what Jesus Christ did. It's true. If you've come to the cross and received him, your sins are washed away. And by the way, if you really believe that, it changes everything. And it leads us to the second because. Because he died on the cross, he took my shame. And I am not defined by my sin. You see, our sin and our shame are two different things. There's lots of Christians who will say, I believe my sins are washed away. They believe it theologically. They believe it intellectually. They understand that Jesus died on the cross. It's what theologians call the substitutionary atonement. You know, that, that, that Jesus died in our place for our sins. He took our sins on himself and we take his righteousness. There's this amazing transaction that happens through the work of Jesus. So many Christians will say, I believe my sins are gone. But if I ask you this question, is your shame gone? Do you know that your shame is washed away? Because Jesus dealt with your sin, he also takes away your shame. And most Christians would say, I still live a lot with shame. But if you know what I've done, you'd know why I feel shameful. Well, here's the good news. God knows what you've done. He's perfectly aware of it. Oh, but if you know what I thought, God knows. If you know what I said, God knows. If you know what I did, God knows. He died for it. He, he died on the cross in your place for those sins. And he says, not only do I take your sins away, I free you from the shame. The shame that locks you up. The shame that embarrasses you at the core of your soul. The shame that makes you think, if God really knew what I'm like, and, and you forget the fact that he does. And he so loved you in the depth of your sin that he died for you on the cross. God is the great shame lifter. And yet we struggle with this. If I asked you, can you look in a mirror and look at yourself and say, I am a person who has no shame. I, 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 not that I never did anything to be ashamed of, but Jesus dealt with it. Therefore, I don't bear the weight of that shame. I was at, uh, at Colorado Christian University not too long ago, and I got to speak to the whole student body about sharing their faith and about evangelism and did a, spoke to the whole, as a chapel, as a chaplain to the whole uh, the whole body of students. Then I also did the evening event for a couple hundred students. Great time, wonder, wonderful Christian university. And I had this young, young student, this young man come up to me afterwards. And he said to me, man, I'm so fired up right now to share my faith in Jesus with other people. But he says, man, when I think about the last few years, I haven't done that. I haven't shared my faith the way I should. I just feel kind of embarrassed and kind of ashamed and I feel bad. And I said to him, don't. And he kind of, kind of looked at me startled. I said, don't. All, you might have missed opportunities. God knows. God's forgiven you. If you think now about the shame of the opportunities you've missed, you're going to miss the opportunities to go forward and live for Jesus. I said, I said to this young student, don't live with shame over the past. Jesus dealt with that. Live with boldness to walk into the future. And I want to say the same thing to you. What is it right now that makes you say, I know my sins are gone because of Jesus, but I still live with shame. And, and this is the time coming to this table remembering his broken body and his shed blood and that he died for you because he died. You don't live with shame anymore. Listen to these words from Hebrews chapter 12. 
beginning in verse 1. In Hebrews 12, 1, we read this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, this is all the people who died in faith before us, who are in heaven cheering us on right now. We are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. One of the biggest hindrances and entanglements to moving forward in your faith is shame. And we're supposed to throw it aside. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, listen to this, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. There was shame on the cross. He bore your sin, he bore your shame. He scorned the shame, but he took our shame, all the cost, all the punishment, all all of the pain of our sin, all the shame of our sin, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand, the right hand of the throne of God. And, And that sitting down was to say the work was done, the work was completed. Consider him, Jesus, who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. If you want to grow weary and you want to lose heart in your faith, just live with shame every day. Let the whispers of the enemy fill your ears and your heart and your mind. And spend your time saying, I blew it here. I messed up there. Man, that was bad. That was terrible. I I almost wonder if God really loves me. I know he loves me, but I wonder if he really loves me. Shame is a liar. And like sin was destroyed on the cross, shame was cast down. And so because, because he died, he lifts our shame off of our shoulders and sets us free. Years ago, I was watching a a TV show, and it was in a time where a couple different pretty well-known pastors had messed up pretty publicly, made some some really bad choices, got caught doing some things that pastors shouldn't be doing. And then this panel of different pastors gathered together, and this, uh, this news anchor was interviewing these pastors and asking them questions. And one of the news anchors said to E.V. Hill, and E.V. Hill uh, was, is with Jesus now, but was one of my favorite preachers. I got to hear him preach live in his home church in South Central L.A., and what a passionate, godly preacher, and what a great man of faith. And, and, and this, this news anchor said to E.V. Hill, he said, um, well, you know, well, Pastor Hill, if you had sinned, and if you had, and, and, and he, was gonna, you know, he kind of said to him, if you had sinned, and E.V. Hill cuts him off, and he says, let there be no if. And the news anchor was kind of like, didn't know what he was talking about. And he says, well, okay. Well, he says, well, now if you had sinned, and EVL says, let there be no if. And the, the anchor says, I, I don't know what you, you're talking about. And EVL looked at this news anchor and he said, he said, you said, if I've sinned. And I said, let there be no if. So there's no if, I've sinned. And then he said this, the difference is my sin's not public. He says, nobody knows about my sin except for Jesus, and he dealt with it. I thought, wow, let there be no if. We don't walk without shame because we haven't done things that are shameful. We walk free of sin because Jesus bore our shame and our sin, and he dealt with it. So today, when we come to the table, when you're in your home and you partake of the bread or the cracker or whatever you have to partake of, and when you partake of the drink and drink from the cup, Remember, not only is your sin gone, your shame is gone. That's true. So here's the question. What shame do you need to place at the foot of the cross today? As we partake of communion just in in a short time from now, what shame is the enemy lying about? What shame do you carry in your heart? What do you need to bring to the table and say, Jesus, your body was broken, your blood was shed, you paid the price for my sin, and you took my shame. Jesus, I give it to you. And I pray that you would give me a peace that I don't have to live in shame, that I won't listen to the voice of the enemy, but I will walk in confidence that you've dealt with my shame and it's gone. Man, that will set you free because he died. Because he died. Here's another thing we need to understand. On the cross, he made me his child and I live as a son or daughter. When Jesus died on the cross, he said, not only do I wash your sins away, not only do I lift your shame, but because I paid the price for you and because you've received my grace, when we accept his forgiveness and what he did on the cross, he says, you are now my daughter. You are now my son. You are my beloved child. Wow. Do you have any adoption in your family? Well, if you're a Christian, you do. You were adopted by God Almighty. 
You are made his child through faith in Jesus Christ. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1, we read these words. In John 1, beginning in verse 12, this is sort of the beginning of the Gospel in the Gospel of John. Yet to all who did receive him, that's received Jesus Christ, accepted his forgiveness and his grace on the cross. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. Your new birth, you being born again, is the gift of God through Jesus Christ. And when you come to the cross and you receive Jesus Christ and you confess your sins, he says, you are now my beloved child. That is staggering. That is amazing. That is beautiful. And you are more precious in the eyes and the sight of God than you understand. You are his beloved. Not long ago, I had a chance to drive across country with my youngest son. Uh, My son, Nate, and his wife, Bryn, uh, moved to Michigan. And he's pastoring at a church there. And so I got to drive country with him, uh, cross country with him. And, and we had a great drive together. And as we got near the end of the drive, he kind of just said, he said, you know, thank you for, you know, thank you for doing this. Thank you for taking the time. And he was really appreciative. And I, and I kind of got a little bit, uh, kind of just tenderhearted in that moment, thinking as a dad, I thought, what, you know, what wouldn't I do for my son? I'd do anything for him. And I said, I said, Nate, can you imagine someday when your son, his firstborn child is a son, when your son Cohen is a young man and if he and his wife were moving somewhere, and I, say, I, said, I said, I want you to imagine driving cross country with Cohen and what a privilege that would be. And he looked at me and he said, well, we couldn't do it right now because his legs are too short and he couldn't spend time driving because he couldn't reach the gas pedal and his arms wouldn't reach. He can't, and he had to sit on a box. And, and I said, he was joking, obviously. <laughs> I, said, I said, but Nate, <laughs> seriously for a minute, you know, what would you do for your son? And he said, I'd do anything for him. And I said, and you just got to know him. He's not even two years old yet. Imagine when you've known him for a lifetime, how much you'll love him, what you would do for him. And that's God's heart towards us. He looks at us as his precious children. And he says, I would do anything for you. And he has. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the love of God for his children. And if you've come to the cross and received Jesus, you are his child. Because he died, we are made children. What a gift that is. Just pause with me and pray about this. Lord, thank you. God Almighty, thank you that you call us your children, that you, that you love us with the heart of a perfect father that you call us your own. And there's nothing you wouldn't do for us because you've already done everything for us when you gave your life on the cross. So Lord, help us to just walk in that understanding that not only is our sin forgiven, not only is our shame gone, but we are children of God Almighty, loved and precious, adopted into your family, not by the work of human beings, but by the hand of God Almighty, by your own hand. And we give you praise for this reality. Amen. Here's a question. Will you let God whisper his deep fatherly love and will you receive it? Will you right now just quiet your heart and say, God, remind me that I am a loved child because we forget sometimes. Would you take some quiet time in the next 24 hours and just, just sort of get away from everything if you can and just say, God, will you remind me that I'm your child. Would you remind me that I'm precious to you? And he will do it. He longs to remind you of that truth. Because he died, there's more, there's more. Because he died on the cross, he destroyed the power of sin, hell, and the grave. And because of that, I am fearless and walk in his victory. On the cross, Jesus broke the power of sin and hell and death and the grave and the enemy of our souls. Jesus won and he broke the power of the enemy. Therefore, I am fearless and I can walk in victory. Not because I'm victorious in my own power, but we hold on to the victory of Jesus Christ. His victory becomes our victory because we're adopted as his children. 
We inherit what he has, and he has the victory, which means you have the victory if you put your faith in him. That's amazing. That's glorious. That's good news. On one of the darkest days of the Christian year, remembering the death of Jesus, we have to remember the light that was shed, not just on Easter morning, but what set the table, literally the table of communion, but the table of God's will for our lives. On Good Friday, we see the price that Jesus paid and the victory that he won. Look with me at Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 13. In Romans 6, 13, we read these words. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. We are not enslaved to sin. We are set free and we can walk in the victory of Jesus Christ. This is the moment that we stop and say, Jesus, you won the victory. And because you call me your own, I walk in that victory. And so Jesus, this is our prayer, that we would walk and live in the victory that you have won. That we would humbly receive that posture of confidence, that that awareness of strength and power. And that certainty of the victory, that even though in this life there may be skirmishes and battles, Jesus, you have won the war. And on the cross, you were victorious. And in the empty tomb, you signed the truth of what you had done on the cross. Let us walk in your victory, we pray, for your glory. Amen. So here's what I want you to think about. Will you walk and live with certainty that the battle is won and Jesus is on the throne? Can you walk each day and each moment confident? God won, he's on the throne. And I'm his child, so I walk in victory. Well, one more, because. Because he died. On the cross, he finished the work So we can say, I don't need to add to what Jesus has done. There is nothing I can add to the work of Jesus on the cross. And again, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you know that. You know I don't have to do anything to make God love me. I don't have to do anything to earn forgiveness. I couldn't do anything. God paid the price. But sometimes we act like I need to do things to add to the work of Jesus. And we don't. Everything we do is a response to the greatness of his grace. In John 19, verse 30. Jesus is hanging on the cross. He's bearing our sins. He's taking our shame. He's winning the victory. And we read this in John 19, 30. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. In the Greek language, that's only one word. To telestai, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus was absolutely clear that on the cross, He won the victory. He paid the price and it was done. We don't add to what Jesus has done. Our salvation is not, okay, the work of Jesus on the cross and how many offerings I give. No, it's the work of Jesus on the cross. Our salvation is not Jesus' death on the cross and how many hours I volunteer at the church. No, our salvation is based on the death of Jesus on the cross and us receiving it by grace. Now, is it good to give offerings? Yes, is it good to volunteer in the church? Is it good to do lots of other things? Absolutely, but what we say is, because he's paid the price, because he's done it, because it's finished, I will live out of thankfulness and joy and walk in grace, and I'll do these things because he loves me, not to get him to love me. I'll do these things because he paid 100% of the payment for me. I'm not not earning off part of it. I've often asked people who, who really aren't sure if they want to become a Christian, They'll say, well, I I I haven't lived a very good life. I've made some mistakes. And I'll I'll, I'll ask them, well, how much of your salvation do you think is based on how good you are and how much you do? Is 90% Jesus' work on the cross and 10% your efforts and works? Is it 50-50? Until we understand that it's 100% and zero, we don't have the gospel. We don't understand the gospel. It's 100% the work of Jesus on the cross that offers salvation. We were not God in human flesh. We did not bear the sins of all humanity. We can't pay the price. 
What we do is respond to the goodness of this amazing grace. It's finished in Jesus. The price is paid 100%. And now I live out of gratitude and joy and follow him and walk with him. So let's pray one more time as we think about the fact that because he died, everything in the heavenly realms in our hearts and lives have been transformed. Join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, we praise you that you have won the victory, that it is finished. And God, we pray that we will understand this in the depth of who we are, that we will spend no more time trying to earn your love. It was offered to us in the depth of our sin. That we will spend no more time trying to add to what you did on the cross because Jesus, you finished the work and it is finished, it is done. Lord, let us spend all of our days and all of our time and all of our energy responding to this good gift that you washed away our sin, that you took away our shame, that you call us your sons and your daughters, that we've inherited the victory that you won and that it is finished. We just respond, rejoicing and thanking you. And Lord, as we prepare to come to the table, as we prepare to share communion together, will you meet us in this time? Will you show up right in our apartment, right in our home, right in the trailer we live in, wherever we are? Maybe, maybe someone's traveling and they're doing this service on the road somewhere and they just pulled over the side of the road for a moment to be part of this moment, wherever we are. God, your spirit can just show up right there. And Lord, for anyone who maybe doesn't have bread or crackers or juice or wine or anything to eat or drink right now, Lord, they're just a symbol. May they experience your presence just as sweetly, just as beautifully as if they had the elements in front of them. Because Jesus, you're there. And you're the one that makes communion powerful. Meet us in this moment, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we share communion this Good Friday, I want to share a couple thoughts, a couple becauses. Because we have received Jesus, he invites us to the table. If you've received Jesus Christ, if you've come to the cross and confessed your sins and asked Jesus to forgive you, he says, this is the table of the Lord, which means it's the table of all of those whose sins are washed away and who are children of God. If you're a follower of Jesus, I pray you'll meet Jesus in this moment. Because his body was broken, we can be made whole. You know, the bread that we break reminds us of the broken body of Jesus. And because he's been broken, he says, I can put you back together because he paid the price. And because his blood was shed, the cup in communion is a reminder of the blood of Jesus shed for us. And because his blood has been shed, we can understand that our sins are washed away. We're cleansed. So listen to God's word from Matthew chapter 26. Just quiet your heart and listen. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take this and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I invite you to take whatever it is you had around your house there that's the reminder of the body of Jesus. And this is just a reminder. The element's not the point. The point is the one it represents. And Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. So will you take that? And as you partake of it, Will you remember his body broken? Remember the greatness of his love. Remember the price he paid because he loves you. Let's partake together. Lord Jesus, thank you for your body broken. Thank you for the price that you paid. Help us remember this gift, the price you paid, the greatness of your love. 
And now if you'll take the cup. Remember his bloodshed. Remember the price that he paid. In the Bible, it says, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. And Jesus gave his life out of love for you. Let's partake of the cup together. Jesus, thank you for your bloodshed, for dying in our place, taking our sins. And thank you for what you accomplished as your body was broken, your blood was shed, and you took our place on the cross. We give you praise. We celebrate you. We glorify you. And we thank you that you meet with us in this moment, right where we are. And we pray this in Jesus' name.